During the Polish-Muscovite War, a Polish prince was elected Tsar of Russia in 1610. However, his Swedish-born Catholic father and current king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a country most people only learned about after playing Europa Universalis, refused because of the condition that his son must convert to Orthodox Christianity. Thus, Michael Romanov was elected Tsar, beginning the Romanov dynasty which ruled the Russian Empire until it was overthrown during the February Revolution in 1917. But, before it was overthrown, this same dynasty would oversee the partitioning and destruction of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth by 1795. And while both Poland and Lithuania would regain their independence around the same time the Romanovs fell, they spent most of it more or less being under Russia's thumb. But what if things happened differently? What if Russia was under the thumb of Poland? Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrich, the Alternate Historian, and in this video we're going to be looking at the time Poland almost conquered Russia. Time for some wonderful historical context. You see, after the Tsar died in 1598, Russia became locked in a civil war that is known in history as the Time of Troubles. To make matters worse, Russia suffered from a terrible famine that lasted from 1601 to 1603, and because misery loves company, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth under Sigismund III Vasa invaded starting the Polish-Moscovite War of 1605 to 1618. Now, our boy Sigismund was a Swedish-born king of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania. Although a Catholic zealot, his rule marked a golden age for the Commonwealth as the nation experienced great prosperity during his reign. He even briefly united both the Commonwealth and Sweden into a personal union in 1592, but his refusal to respect the faith of the predominantly Lutheran Swedes meant he was deposed as King of Sweden by his uncle Charles IV in 1599 and he would absolutely make the same damn mistake again in Russia. Although the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was strapped for cash and its military was rather small, they did remarkably well and at one point even captured Moscow in 1610. Although this happened after Poland tried to put not one, but two dudes on the Russian throne who both pretended to be the youngest son of Ivan the Terrible. The time of troubles was weird. Anywho, what was surprising about the Polish-Muscovite War was that the invaders had support among the Russian boyars or nobles, especially those poor provincial types who wanted someone to bring stability and particularly liked how much power Polish nobles had in the Commonwealth. For example, regardless of rank, a Polish noble had the same legal rights as any other and had a vote in the Polish parliament, the same, which could choose the next king. In Russia, however, many nobles found their opportunities for, shall we say, career advancement blocked by the nobles of Moscow. Now, here's where things get really crazy. In 1610, a group of Russian nobles elected Sigismund's 15-year-old son, Władysław, as Tsar because Sigismund wasn't very popular out east. There was one condition, however, which was that Władysław converted to Orthodox Christianity, the predominant religion of Russia. Sigismund, however, was kind of a greedy Catholic zealot and rejected any compromise or concessions that could have led to Russia voluntarily uniting with the Commonwealth. Instead, he wanted to seize the throne of Russia for himself with the goal of converting the entire population to Catholicism. As you can probably guess, the Russians didn't like this one bit, and those few nobles who supported the Poles turned on them. Michael Romanov was chosen to be Tsar, the Poles were kicked out of Russia, and for the price of a few pieces of territory, Russia's independence was preserved, and the time of troubles ended. Ultimately, the whole episode kicked off a rivalry between the two countries that some say lasts until this day. But what if Sigismund changed his mind, and let his son convert to Orthodox Christianity? Admittedly, it's difficult to change Sigismund's mind, as he was a devout Catholic. As I mentioned earlier, he lost the throne of Sweden because being tolerant of Lutheranism was just too much to ask of him, so it's completely in character for him to make the same decision again with Russia. Additionally, there were previous attempts before Władysław to create a personal union between Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, including offering the Polish throne to the Russian Tsar. In every proposal, however, it was under the condition that the monarch convert to the religion of his new kingdom, and each time it was refused. Then again, it's possible for even the most obstinate people to have a change of heart. Maybe Sigismund has a trusted advisor who's a bit more far-sighted than him and can convince him that getting his son on the throne, even if it means his conversion, might still in the long run help convert Russia to Catholicism because it would open the nation to increased Polish influence. Which brings me to Anna Vasa of Sweden. She was Sigismund's younger sister and they were extremely close. Which is odd, given Sigismund's own faith and the fact that Anna converted to Lutheranism after hearing from a Catholic priest that purgatory didn't exist and was only used to scare the common folk into behaving. And yet, despite this, Sigismund treated her like one of his most trusted advisors and even wanted her as his regent in Sweden while he remained in Poland during the brief time he was king of both countries. 
On top of that, she was well-educated, fluent in many languages, and was knowledgeable about medicine. So perhaps she is the best person to figuratively, or literally, smack Sigismund on top of the head and remind him he's about to lose Russia the same way he lost Sweden. Admittedly, my research didn't uncover much of what she thought about bringing Russia into the Commonwealth, but should she take a more active role in advising Sigismund to accept some sort of compromise, he might actually go along with it. Perhaps she could sell the idea of letting Władysław convert in order to create a more powerful Commonwealth that might one day regain control of Sweden, if not for Sigismund, then at least for Władysław and his heirs. Anna could even point out that Wadislaw would be in a good position to negotiate the unification of the Russian Orthodox Church with Rome, which would be less expensive and time-consuming than trying to directly convert the entire population of Russia to Catholicism. In fact, there is some precedent to this idea, since during Sigismund's reign, the Church Union of Berestia, or Union of Brest, was agreed to, which brought the Ruthenian Orthodox Church, today the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and the Belarusian Greek Catholic Church, back under the authority of the Pope. Anna may also come up with some sort of convenient fiction that satisfies both the Russian boyars, who want an Orthodox king, while keeping Wadislaw Catholic for Sigismund. For example, maybe Wadislaw instead converts to one of the Eastern Rite churches that acknowledge the authority of the Pope, but have their own distinct laws and traditions that are more similar to Orthodox Christian churches. It's kind of a long shot, but as the master of alternate history, Harry Turtledove, once said, fiction has to be plausible. All history has to do is happen. So what happens next is Sigismund, however begrudgingly, lets Wadislaw convert to Orthodox Christianity and become Tsar of Russia. Well, assuming the combined Commonwealth and Russian forces are able to defeat any opposition, it's likely Wadislaw would take the title of Grand Duke of Muscovy, a title he actually did use in our timeline, and the Commonwealth would begin the slow process of assimilating Russia. Trade barriers would break down, people could freely move across the border, and while Russia wouldn't immediately become part of the Commonwealth, we could eventually see the same with an influx of new Russian members. Meanwhile, a period of Polonization would begin as Polish language and culture, plus the Roman Catholic faith, would spread across Russia. Such a process would likely be led by the Jesuits, a Roman Catholic religious order that Sigismund supported during his reign. Land in Russia may also be offered to Polish settlers, further drawing Russia into Poland. Of course, there'd be backlash, so it may take several years for the Commonwealth to digest its newest member. Sigismund could try to prevent revolts by guaranteeing the rights of Orthodox Christians and limiting Catholics from participating in the local government, much like he originally promised to do with Sweden in our timeline. But given his zealotry, Sigismund probably would break that promise if he made it at all. Besides, I'm already having him act a little out of character, so we shouldn't assume he'd do a complete 180. In all honesty, we could see several major revolts in Russia against Commonwealth rule, especially if there are attempts to either convert the population directly to Catholicism or have the Russian Orthodox Church be drawn back into the Catholic fold. In fact, something similar happened to Ukraine in the mid-17th century of our timeline in response to Poland trying to spread Catholicism in the region. Then again, Sigismund wouldn't be king in Russia, Wadislaw would, so perhaps if Sigismund stays in Warsaw to govern the core of the Commonwealth, Wadislaw, or his regent, might actually uphold any promises, although it would require a skillful balancing act to keep the Orthodox Russians and Sigismund happy. Additionally, the same, when it receives all of its new Orthodox members, may be more interested in preserving religious tolerance and thus would block any attempt by Sigismund from upsetting the apple cart with all of his converting Russia to Catholicism nonsense. And how would the rest of Europe react to the new Polish-Lithuanian Muscovite Commonwealth? I mean, the Commonwealth would be a superpower by size alone, as this map from the always talented Sean McKnight highlights. And my guess is this would freak out the rest of Europe. In our timeline, Western European nations like Britain and France were always paranoid about Russia being too powerful, and were willing to go to war to check their expansion westward. One would assume they'd do the same with an expanded Commonwealth as well. And there's a strong possibility that the Commonwealth will expand westward. In our timeline, Sigismund was a big supporter of the Counter-Reformation, a Catholic revival movement that sought to combat the expansion of Protestantism, and sought to create a League of Catholic Nations to defeat the Protestants. No doubt he would want to use the power of the expanded Commonwealth as a hammer in the wars of religion, such as the Thirty Years' War, that engulfed 17th century Europe. In fact, in our timeline, Sigismund wanted to intervene inside the Catholic States in the Thirty Years' War, but was prevented by the same. 
Whether the same would relent in this alternate timeline is unclear, but the existence of this expanded commonwealth might convince King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden from intervening in the same war out of fear that his Polish relatives might try to regain control of Sweden by using the newly acquired resources and manpower of Russia. Not only would this mean we would never get Eric Flint's 1632 series, but Gustavus might have lived longer as he wouldn't have died during the Thirty Years' War, so who knows what this would mean for Swedish history. Meanwhile, the electorate of Brandenburg and the Duchy of Prussia, vassals of the Commonwealth during this time, might never evolve into the Kingdom of Prussia, and later the German Empire, as they did in our timeline, as I doubt the Commonwealth would want a strong united Germany on their western border. Of course, the big question is, would the Commonwealth exist in one form or another to the present day, or would it collapse under its own weight? Well, in our timeline, by the end of the 16th century, unanimity was required to pass anything through the same. This was meant to protect the rights of the Commonwealth's most powerful nobles, but in practice meant it was near impossible for the same to pass any laws. This paralyzed the government of the Commonwealth, preventing its leaders from implementing the necessary reforms to keep up with its rivals and contributed to its collapse and partition. Also, despite the Commonwealth's history of religious tolerance, this didn't stop religious strife in the Commonwealth, and Sigismund and other Polish Lithuanian kings did not respect such a policy toward their Ethan Orthodox or Protestant subjects. If this continued, especially in the primarily Orthodox Russian lands, we could see the Commonwealth torn apart by religious strife. Now, to be fair, Władysław, when he became king, was known to be more tolerant of other religions than his father, and did try to reform the Commonwealth government, but even he struggled to get the same to do anything, and his death ended the Polish Golden Age. Then again, Władysław's position in Poland in our timeline was weak because he was not a lord over his own land in the Commonwealth, and thus he lacked a power base. This made him dependent on support of the nobles of Poland and Lithuania. However, in this alternate timeline, he'd be the Tsar of Russia, and thus would have the power of that country when attempting to push through reforms of the Commonwealth. And yet it's possible that Polish nobles would be even less willing to work with Władysław as an Orthodox king, regardless of whatever fiction his father and aunt created, or how seriously he took his religion. The same may even refuse to elect someone from the Polish branch of the House of Vasa, assuming Władysław has a living heir in this alternate timeline, and that royal house would instead end up only ruling Russia. Hey, if a bunch of Germans can rule Britain for centuries, why can't a bunch of Poles do the same thing for Russia? In conclusion, while I think a Polish-Lithuanian Muscovite Commonwealth was possible, due to the inherent weakness of the Commonwealth's government and the religious intolerance gripping Europe at the time, it's difficult to believe it would have lasted for very long. More likely, Russia would throw off Commonwealth rule, or the Polish-Lithuanian Catholics would refuse to elect another Vasa to the throne. The history of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth might get back on track at this point, but then again, their short-lived conquest of Russia might have breathed enough life into the Commonwealth that it may have lasted longer than it did in our history, changing the face of Europe with it. It's hard to say with any certainty what this world would look like, but it's certainly fun to imagine the possibilities. Well, that's all to say on the subject. If you enjoy what I do, please like, comment, subscribe, share this video, support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrich, the Alternate Historian. Bye.